So I'll start first with the problems we find on onions. The most common one we see is Botrytis neck rot. It's caused by a fungus, Botrytis acleida or Botrytis alii. And that fungus likes temperatures in the field of 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You will not see symptoms on your onions while they're in your garden or in your field. The symptoms will show up later in storage, but it will cause an infection of your plants. The spores will be on the leaves and in the neck of the onion, and they survive in the soil. And infections usually occur during moist and cool weather, but they will remain unnoticeable. And when the necks are not dry before you put the onions in storage, then the infection becomes active and about four to six weeks later in storage, when you take your onions out and you cut them open, they will be rotten. And you can lose up to 100% of your onions in a really bad year. So here's what the symptoms are. And I don't know if you can see the cursor. So the infection starts on the neck of the onion and then the fungus migrates down and in the process starts rotting the onion bulbs and eventually the entire bulb will be rotten. You do not always see spores developing on the onion bulbs, but occasionally you can see them on the top. It's that gray powdery mycelium that you see on the top of the onions. Management for Botrytis necrot is actually very easy. You just have to wait before you cut the, the leaves off until they are dry. If you cut them off when they're still green and fresh and juicy, then you will see Botrytis necrot. So here, this onion that's here on the left, it still has green leaves. They're starting to dry up, but they have not dried down yet. And so this neck is still very moist and wet and would be an ideal place for the fungus to colonize and then start rotting the bulb. So you want to wait until this neck is dry and the onions look similar to these here. And then you can cut the neck off. And we do have a fact sheet on Botrytis neck rot that provides the information in more detail. It's on the UPPDL website. And you can find a lot more information about it. And we have seen 100% yield loss of onions in commercial onion fields due to this disease. Another pathogen, it's also a fungal pathogen that can cause storage rot of onions. It's Fusarium basal rot. It's the Fusarium oxysporum, another soil-borne pathogen. It also infects other plants like garlic, chive, shallots. This particular strain of Fusarium oxysporum will only go to onions and, and relatives of onions. Its optimum temperature is 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see above ground symptoms in the field. You might get yellowing of leaves, leaf necrosis. The leaves are starting to die back and you can get wilting of onions. And if you cut the tubers, uh, the bulbs open, they usually have tissue discoloration at the base of the onion, which is kind of brown and watery looking. So you, this is the basal plate of the onion. This is where the fungus enters. You see that these bulbs have no, no roots. The roots have rot rotten already. And then the fungus just moves up into the bulb. And instead, like Botrytis neck rot came from the top down and bas Fusarium basal rot goes from the bottom up. And this is what you can see in the field or in your garden if onions have Fusarium basal rot. But these symptoms on onions do not only apply to Fusarium basal rot, they apply to some insects too. If you have bulb mites feeding on the basal plate of your onions, they're tiny, these mites, but with a strong hand lens, you can see them. They're like little white, shiny 
droplets that, that move around. Also maggots can get into the base of those onions and feed on the roots and they, once the roots are gone, the plant can't take up any more nutrients and water and the leaves will start to die back and the plant starts to wilt. So it's, it's very important to determine what the cause is. If you have a hand lens, you can look for maggots and bulb mites. And if you can't see any, you might want to contact Nick or me and we can take a look and see if, if it might be fusarium basal rot. Management for fusarium basal rot, you have to use crop rotation for three to four years at least, since the fungus is soil borne. There are some resistant onion varieties you can use. And if you do store onions, you want to store them at 39 degrees or less. Another fungal disease that you can also find on onions that you buy at the store is black mold caused by Aspergillus niger. It can survive on dead plant material and it's not specific to onions. It can colonize any dead plant material or sometimes also other um, vegetables. The spores are both in the soil and airborne. It also likes it warm. It likes temperatures of 82 degrees to 93 degrees Fahrenheit. The symptoms you initially see is a black discoloration in the neck area of the onion. The dark lesions with spores develop and a fungus has has dark black spores. That's where the name Niger comes from. And you see those on the outer scales. And that's what you, if you look at onion bulbs in the stores, you can sometimes see that it's under the outer scales. You see a, a line of dark black spores. Sometimes this fungus can be mistaken for smut, which is another fun, uh, fungal pathogen. But we rarely see that one in Utah. I've only seen it once, whereas I see black mold all the time. But if you have a microscope available, or you can send us a sample, then we can take a look and tell you if it's bulb rot or if it's smut. And then eventually the bulbs will start rotting. So here on the right, this is what I mentioned initially under the scales. This these scales were peeled back and you can see the rows of black spores. And then eventually the rod will progress and you get the entire bulb, in, the inside to rot. It provides entrance points for other pathogens to get in and your bulb will in the end be just mush. To manage black rot or black mold, you want to prevent the wounding or bruising of bulbs during harvest. Store the bulbs below 59 degrees Fahrenheit. If you transport bulbs somewhere at a higher temperature, even if the fungus is not growing at the moment, as soon as the temperatures get above 59 degrees Fahrenheit, it will resume the growth and it will eventually rot the bulb. Another disease that we sometimes see, especially on white onions, are pink spots. You can also find that on bulbs in the store. There are two potential causes for that. There is pinking, which is a response to bruising during harvest. And there's another fusarium species, fusarium proliferatum, which can sometimes cause that. Most of the time, this disease is only on the outer scales of the onion bulbs. So if you peel those off, onions below are perfectly fine. In rare cases, Fusarium proliferatum, if that's the cause, it can cause a bulb rot. But I've tried it and I had to really create the perfect conditions for this fungus to get it to actually rot the bulb. This is more of a cosmetic issue, I would think. Now we move on to potatoes. This is not really a bulb or a tube or rot in storage, but most of the time people won't notice it until they have their potatoes in storage. 
In zebra chip disease, it's caused by a non-culturable bacterium called Liberibacter solanaceum. It's most important on potatoes. You can find it as well on tomatoes and peppers as well. And the name zebra chip disease comes from the potato chips. So the symptoms you see here, when you cut a fresh tuber, you get these brown striations. If you just boil the potatoes and mash them, you won't even notice that they were infected. There's no flavor difference. It's not harmful to you. But if you are in the potato chip business and you want to sell your potatoes to, let's say, Frito-Lay or somebody else, or you want to make your own potato chips, these infected tubers get these very dark brown rings and striations. And nobody wants potato chips that look like that. And that's where the name zebra chip comes from. The bacteria are transmitted by potato psyllids. They're very small insects. They look like winged aphids. They're black. And if you have a hand lens and you can get a hold of one, they have this big white stripe across the back, which allows you to identify them. The nymphs you can see here in the middle, they're very hard to see without a um, dissecting microscope. You need to go to fairly high magnification. They look like little armored personnel carriers. And then the eggs are laid on stems right along the margin of the leaves. And they're so small that you can almost not see them even with a dissecting microscope. Above ground, the symptoms you see can resemble nutrient deficiencies. You get uh, purpling and yellowing of leaves. It's a reaction of the plant to the feeding by the psyllids. The saliva of the psyllids has a toxin in it that causes the plant to react in that way. But the only way to differentiate between a nutrient deficiency and zebra chip disease is to test for the presence of the bacteria in the plant or get a nutrient analysis to see if there's any potassium or phosphorus deficiency. Management of Liberibacter or zebra chip disease is difficult. You can scout for potato psyllids, put out yellow sticky cards, and regularly look at them with a hand lens. You can start controlling the psyllids if you have them with imidacloprid starting early in the season. Good weed management to reduce the amount of host plants for the psyllids. But once a plant is infected, there's no cure for it. Like I said, most of the time you won't even notice that your potatoes have an infection until you actually have them in storage and you cut one open that's raw. Another disease of potatoes that we see in storage is bacterial soft rot. It's caused by the bacterium Pectobacterium carotovarum. It also goes to other root crops like carrots and sometimes onions. The bacteria are usually found on seed pieces. They can also be in the soil. And initially you see just some tissue discoloration on the outside. And then over time, the bacteria continue to rot the tubers. And the bacteria produce enzymes that can dissolve the cell wall. So all the cell contents will pool in the center of the tuber. And when you cut them open, you have all this liquid inside. And they have a very foul odor. If you have a rotten potato in your fridge, you will know it. It, it smells very strongly. The bacteria enter through lenticels, cracks, or other injuries that are caused to the tubers during cultivation and, and harvest. And to manage soft rot, crop rotation to non-tuber root crops can help buy seed pieces that are free of rot symptoms, avoid overwatering, 
and avoid tuba injury during harvest. Internal heat necrosis is something that I've noticed, especially buying russet potatoes at the store. They, this is um, not a real disease. It's a physiological problem that occurs if you have very high day and night temper temperatures in both the air and the soil, and you have low soil moisture. So this year when we had these very high temperatures early in the season, and we have a drought, it could be that you might encounter this more often. And there's some varieties that are more susceptible like Yukon gold, russet potatoes, as well as Atlantic and chieftain varieties. And most of the time, those tubers are very firm. So unless you actually cut them open, you will not see that this core is discolored. Management of internal heat necrosis, avoid heat stress. You can do that um, by having a healthy canopy that shades the hills and reduces the soil temperature. Proper nutrient management to promote a good vine and tuber growth. And avoid harvesting the bulbs during very high soil temperatures. And then we have rhizopus on little pumpkins. That was an unusual storage disease. These pumpkins were harvested right after we had very strong winds with heavy dust and sand being blown across some fields. And it, you couldn't see anything obvious, but as soon as these pumpkins went into storage, rhizopus started growing in the right around the stem. And this was caused because these um, little pumpkin fruits had been sandblasted. And so there were all these minute wounds that were created during that storm. And then as soon as they were in storage, the temperature was reduced in the storage. There was higher humidity, that fungus starts growing. Rhizopus takes any vegetable, fruit, bread, anything it can grow on that provides any nutrients. It's not very picky what it eats and it, it grows very, very fast. It and thus wounds the fruit through wounds created by insects blowing sand or equipment. And the only way you can reduce the injury is by reducing the injury to plants. Now, Nick asked me to talk a little bit about watermelon rind necrosis. It's not a storage disease, but he had quite a few questions about this problem this year. The actual cause for watermelon rind necrosis is not known. Bacteria have been isolated. A lot of different bacteria have been found, but they have never been definitely linked to these symptoms. You can take a perfectly healthy watermelon and take samples out of those the rind and you will get bacteria to grow. There's a lot of non-pathogenic bacteria that just hang out on watermelons. So there's a hypothesis that the symptom is actually triggered by stress and that this stress causes a hypersensitive response in the um, watermelon if there are any bacteria present and it just has the tissue die back trying to prevent these bacteria from growing. 